Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran Connecticut-based drummer Ken Serio. We caught up with him while his town was in the midst of a huge blizzard to talk about his latest 2022 CD, The Fuse Box, that came out on January 14th on Tripping Tree Music. The album is a fusion of jazz, blues, and prog rock featuring Mike Stern and Brian Charette. He grew up on the Pawtuck, Connecticut, westerly Rhode Island border. He was inspired by seeing Ringo Starr on TV early on, and he would finally get his first drum set at 14, and he never looked back. One of those big moments in his life was meeting the great Danny Gottlieb, one of the drumming idols from the Pat Metheny group. Danny introduced Ken to his teacher, the great Joe Morello, and that would lead to wonderful things. He's got the full story. Enjoy. I guess it'd be a good diversion to talk about music right now, so thanks for taking that out. <laughs> yeah, no, pro- no problem. Right on. So your new CD, Fuse Box, coming out, or it's been, a, it's, it came out on January 14th. It features Mike Stern and Brian Charette. Talk to me a little bit about this project. And, like, you know, and now also, obviously, with the weather, we have COVID and all these things going on. How does it feel to have this album out now? Well, luckily, with COVID, the whole COVID thing, I mean, there are good things that happen uh, from bad things sometimes. You know, everyone was itching to play during the whole COVID thing, especially last year when there was no gigs and stuff. So everyone was itching to play. So I was able to get all these great players to, you know, who, who were dying to play. And, and it was just fun to, you know, it was, you know, even Mike Stern was like, yeah, man, I want to play. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, this is great. That whole concept of that record started a long time ago, like 2015 or 2016, when I found this guitar player from Athens, Greece. We made friends online, Achilles Demontius. He is on the record. He actually, you know, co-wrote half the record with me, um, and he's on the first the first tune. He's on like five tunes, even the uh, the Billy Cobham tune. But anyway, um, the whole idea of the thing was that I was going. I went into the studio and laid down some drum tracks, and then I was going to, you know, give him some ide- ideas, and then he was going to kind of c- compose backwards. Like, uh, you know, basically, you know, usually the composer usually writes a melody and then the drummer puts this stuff on where it was, this was going backwards. Well, anyway, I, I did like 10 tracks for this and then he lost his he lost his studio uh, due to the real bad economy in, in Greece and everything. He lost his beautiful studio. So these tracks were hanging around for, for years. For, for, you know, literally almost five years. And I approached other people because they were well recorded and they had, you know, it was good ideas. They were, they were good ideas. They were unique ideas, I thought. Anyway, and I kept going back to them once in a while and saying, uh, you know, this is, this, this, this is too good to like just throw out. And I kept it on the back burner and then, Let's see, I approached a bunch of people with this, and some people didn't even want to touch the idea of, of, of composing with me backwards like this. <laughs> they were scared to death of it. Uh, but I did speak to someone uh, who's a good friend of mine. I've used to, I played with many for many years. Uh, I don't know if you know who Pete McCann is. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, Pete McCann, great guitar player. He lives, he's originally from Wisconsin. Uh, he lives in New Jersey now. We used to play all the time. So I approached him about doing this project and he he was basically in the middle of of composing for his next record so he was too busy to do it but he said i know this keyboard player he gave me a whole list of a whole, a whole bunch of people but he goes i know this keyboard player who does this all the time he does it for a living he goes he goes he does, he'll write anything any style anything you want and that was brian Turet. and i had never heard of him and uh i started speaking to him and, and before you knew it, the, you know, emails were coming in with these beautiful tunes <laughs> and he basically co-wrote half the tunes with me on the record. And, and it was like magic because he went places. I, I wasn't even thinking on some of the tunes, for instance, uh, the one that one of the ones that Mike Stern plays on, on a Sunday afternoon, that one there, uh, I was totally thinking like a weather report type of groove. And he made it into this like soulful bluesy thing, and it was great because it, you know, I mean, it's it, it, that's what's great about composing this way was you know it's a total surprise. And so anyway, so we now I have half a record with keyboards on it and my bass player playing on it, and 
And now I'm like, okay, well. And then right at that time, I spoke to Achilles again, and he had a studio again in Athens, Greece. So I gave him the other half of the tunes, and he started co-composing with me, and that's the rest of the record. And all of a sudden, it came together real, real quick. It came together in probably about three months. And then the rest of the summer, we mixed it. It was was a complete internet thing. It was, I've never done a record like that before. But, you know, with COVID, that's kind of how people are making records, you know. I just saw that uh, Sting did his last record that way. And I know John McLaughlin's new record was done that way, too. So, you know, it's kind of what we, what you you got to get creative when, when, you know, you can't get together, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess the one thing, too, during this time, this COVID time, you know, hopefully things get better as we get further into the year. But what did you kind of learn about yourself over this time of self-reflection that maybe you didn't realize before that's going to make you stronger as we all kind of get back into the world? Well, I, I learned a lot about production, in, uh, you know, uh, about pr- producing and pr- production a little bit. I also realized that I'm too damn dumb to quit. <laughs> you know, that, that you know, I, I guess I, I'm I'm stuck with this for the rest of my life. I mean, it's not going to go away. I mean, I want to make music. I want to put out, you know, good good quality projects, you know. So, you know, and, and it's just, it, it, it's brought out some creativity that, you know, in different ways where, you know, I wasn't able to go down, sit down on the drums every day, you know, not having a studio. Uh, so you have other ways to keep in shape, you know, with your playing and stuff too. Well, so. let me jump back to the beginning of your life. You know, you were inspired by seeing Ringo Starr and, you know, you started out very early on. Talk to me about this passion for the drum kit and being a musician. Okay. I I think that probably Ringo was probably the first drummer I ever saw. Saw saw well on T V anyway. And then uh I think I saw I, I think I saw a drummer at a wedding one time with my parents when I was probably about five. And then come to come you know, the strange thing happened that my next door neighbor had a drum set. And I was like, you know, it was a blue sparkle and it just caught my eye. And I was just like, wow. And then I went up to hear him play and it was so loud. And then I ran away because I was only five years old, you know, it scared the heck out of me. I didn't realize they were that loud. But then my parents bought me a, um, I was always banging on my grandma's pots and pans with wooden spoons. <laughs> so my parents bought me a, a, a toy drum set, basically. And I wrecked that in about a month. So, uh, but at all this time, I just kept, you know, I'm just really, I, I had very young parents. My parents were 22 and, and 20. So they were really into some really, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, they were really into some hip music from, I remember, you know, even though it was probably on eight tracks and 45s, I, I you know, I remember listening to Cream and Deep Purple and Vanilla Fudge and and all these heavy heavy rock bands that they liked but they also were into like Lisa Franklin and James Brown and and you know it was kind of it was kind of a really cool time because things were really versatile then you know even you know, on the radio you'd hear all kinds of different styles just listening to lots of music and then finally when i was about 11 i joined the junior high band and i started learning my rudiments and all that stuff and then I started mowing lawns and saved up enough money to buy a um, 1962 Rogers Rogers Holiday Drum Kit, which was a great drum set. I've had it, I had it for until like last year. Somebody bought it because it's it's actually was a like considered vintage then. Right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was my first drum set, and I basically what I would do uh, is after school I would go home and my parents had this couch down in the basement next to the stereo and, and I opened it and there was probably literally 545s there. So what I would do is just pick a 45 and try to learn the drums to it and play it until I either played it well or played it even better than the part that that, it, that it was on the record or whatever. And I just kept doing that and, and I got better and better at it and then and then, you know, went into high school and started, started you know, in rock bands, things like that. And then eventually started seriously taking lessons. 
later on, uh, probably in my mid twenties, I really started to, you know, um, study a lot. One of my teachers had, um, was from Providence. His name was Evan Burr and he ha had been going to New Jersey to study with Joe Morello, the great Joe Morello from the Dave Brubeck days. And he also was, was taking lessons with Danny Gottlieb from the Pat Metheny group. So I, I remember somebody letting me borrow a Pat Metheny record, the, the White Album. I'm sure you know that record, right? You know, the, the Pat Metheny group, the first one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, one of my favorite, still one of my favorite. That record changed my life when I heard Danny's playing and, and just the way that band sounded with Mark, Mark Egan with the fretless bass and everything that I just, whoever let me borrow that record, it, it, I don't think they ever got it back because <laughs> I just played it. I just played it each side. It was just, it was just wow. I, I, I never heard anything like that before. And, uh, it, that really changed things. But anyway, so, so I, through Evan, who was in who was in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, I con contacted. Uh, I went to the city a few times to see him too, and met him. I contacted Danny Gottlieb, and Danny says, "Well, I don't really teach much, but here's Joe Morello's number." And I was like, "Really? You, you know, I'm going to study with Joe Morello." And so, sure enough, uh, I started driving, and it was probably like three and a half hours each way from here, from where I live now. This is where I grew up. Um, uh, I started like every two weeks. I would go and study with Joe, and that changed my life. I mean, that Joe Joe is an amazing teacher, and uh, I ended up moving to New Jersey, and right outside the city. And you know, but uh, for twenty three years I was with Joe, and uh, you know, I miss him. I'd still be taking lessons with him. Uh, he completely changed the way I played. And what I played, and you know how I played it, and you know it, I'm still working on his stuff today. Amazing, amazing teacher. He's really known for technique. Uh, you know, he wanted to be a classical drummer, I guess you'd say, uh, but he was blind in one eye, so he couldn't see the conductor well. So his teacher told him, uh, perhaps you should think about trying to play jazz, and then the rest is history. That's kind of what I was getting at, and and I'm curious, what was the first live jazz show that you saw that really blew your mind? I guess, you know, it was it was probably not a real jazz show. It was, I think, the very first very first concert that wasn't a rock and roll concert was probably Spyro Gyra. Uh, I would say probably around 1985. And that yeah, that had Richie Morales on it. Coincidentally, it was one of Joe's students that I found out later. But that that just changed. I was like, wow, there's music like this, I, you know. And, and then I started realizing there's a bin in the back back of the store that has all this this jazz music <laughs> that I never saw before. And then then, then I start, you know then I started going to that bin and and you know looking up and then I discovered Tony Williams and I discovered uh, Miles Davis and I didn't really like Miles Davis at first because cause he has that real loose thing and if you don't you're not used to it. I remember my friend said Miles Davis is going to be on Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you remember that in in the uh, it was probably late eighties. Yeah. And so I, so yeah, he was on Saturday Night Live. Uh, so, so I stood, stayed up and watched it. I'm like, I can't wait because everyone had told me, oh, you got to, you got to get into Miles. You got to get into Miles. And so I stayed up and I thought it was terrible. I had never really heard Miles Davis before, and it was loose. And you know, I'm expecting, I'm expecting like a Maynard Ferguson kind of trumpet player like you know really ripping technique and, and everything and he you know he just played loose and i just i didn't i was like what's everybody making a big deal about <laughs> but <laughs> but then later on you know and then i went and bought a record uh of miles's and, and it wasn't kind of blue which which i should have started with which everybody usually starts with it was live live evil you know the the, the 1969 record yeah uh, to this day, that record's still very hard to listen to. It's you know, it's recorded kind of rough, and it, it's it's very uh, 
you know, it's it's very jam oriented and it, it's uh, it's an ugly sounding record. <laughs> so that was my yeah. first Miles Davis record, and that's that's kind of hard too. And then I found a Weather Report record, and I bought the wrong one for that too. I, I bought the very first Weather Report record, the one that's just called Weather Report, which was it was pretty out there too. You know, I didn't I didn't buy Mysterious Traveler or or uh, you know the uh, you know uh, what's um, uh, you know, the um, one with Birdland, Jocko, and all that. I, I, I bought one of the, you know, the, the more challenging ones. So, you know, I, didn't ha- I wasn't having good luck. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. lo and behold, you know, I found, I discovered um, Tony Williams, and I became I, totally like crazy, a total Tony Williams freak for a few years. Because he just he played something I'd never heard. I mean, I was like, wow, I didn't know drummers could do this. And then I remember watching reruns one day, and I saw the I Love Lucy show. I think it was the Lucy show, I think it was called at that point, with Desi Arnaz Jr. Yeah. And, and Buddy Rich was on. And I had never heard of Buddy Rich, you know. I didn't, over, over here, you, you, I didn't have a lot of jazz people around here to, to really talk to about this stuff. And I just said to my grandmother, I said, have you ever heard of Buddy Rich? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, he played with Frank Sinatra, you know, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, oh, so he's, like, famous too, huh? I, I thought, it, you know. So then I discovered Buddy Rich, and that was, you know, wow. You know, that opened up a whole different thing for me because then big band music and, you know, now that you, get, you know, the drums are up front. And, you know, it was just, like, totally uh, – yeah, you know, awe, awe inspiring. You know, to to see see somebody play like that. You know, and you've been at this for a long time. What's been kind of the key to your longevity? What, what do you like the best about being a professional musician? <laughs> well, I think I already said it before, but it, but but it, it is what Joe Morello did tell me one day, and it is the secret to success is being too damn dumb to quit. But <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. It's really true. But. But I think what happened with me, you know, you th- I, sometimes I have students that are, are like on the fence about going professional or, you know, going, jumping off the deep end a little bit because they're playing really well and they, they don't know their parents are kind of conservative and they, they're like, well, you know, being a musician is a hard life and everything. And, and they either go for it. I've had a few that have gone for it and become professional musicians. And I've also had a couple that just stopped because their parents were like, well, you know, that's not really the the kind of life we want for you or whatever. I realized now that it it picked me. I didn't pick it. It it picked me. And there was no way I was going to I was going to walk away from it because it was in me. You know, it, it go, I was, like, obsessed. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. And, you know, the one thing I was going to ask, too, you know, you played around big names from Billy Joel, Alicia Keys, uh, Joy Ramone, the Beastie Boys. You've been all over the place. What have you learned from these kind of legends, luminaries, big people in the industry that you, in turn, have used to, like, influence younger players that you get around? Um. I would say all those things were just being at the right place at the right time, but also, you know, when you get an opportunity to play, you know, you better be able to play your best. I mean, I learned that moving to New York, it was like, they're not messing around, you know. They're not messing around. In the first first couple of years I was in New York, uh, you know, I probably wasn't ready for it. Uh, I got my butt kicked really bad. You know, uh, at sessions and, and, you know, playing in either jazz or rock things. I, I was all over the place. But but the, the quality and the attitude and the, and the musicianship was there, no matter what style of music it was. And it was, it, it kicked my butt and it made me so much more of a aggressive, maybe a little more aggressive and a, of a player, but also a better player, you know. So I would say, you know, um, how um, I would probably say it really, you know, it just really kicked my butt and, and got me to another level uh, just because I was playing with people who were really, really had their stuff together a lot more than I did. Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. 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 That makes sense. 
you know, what's your 2022 looking like? What do you, how do you see things opening up and promoting this album and all of that? Do you see some daylight coming up? Yes. Um, actually, um, Dominic, that, you know, uh, he's, he's kind of managing my band right now. And, um, we're going to, we're hopefully if, if COVID doesn't, you know, recirculate again in Europe, we're, we plan on going to Europe in either April or May. I don't know if that will happen just because I'm, you know, we want to do it right. And if, you know, if, if people are, people are still staying inside and, you know, there's lockdowns and stuff, then we'll, we'll put it on hold. But what, what basically happened from this project was, you know, people were like, well, this is a, we really like the CD. How are you going to play it live? Because, you know, the players are all from all over the world. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's a good thing. I, I, that is that, that is interesting. How are we going to do that? So we kind of, we're working on a new record right now, which is called The Jazz Warriors. Uh, and it has a very funny cover also in like Roman gladiator things. <laughs> it's, it's, it, mm. it, it, but it's a set band. It's a set band. And, and the set band is is... My bass player, Jed Kabowski, who lives here in Connecticut, who's in my jazz trio also. I've been playing with him for quite a few years now. And a great pianist from New Jersey uh, that I played with for years when I moved to Jersey, uh, Tomoko Ono. I don't know if you know of her. And then the other the other person, the guitar player on the record, is, is actually on the fuse back, and that's the other uh, guy from Greece. Um, from northern Greece, and that's Sakis Zacharias, and um, he's a great player too. So we basically have a set band, and you know that's what what's going to go to Europe, and then who knows where it'll go from there. But but basically, we needed you know a live act. So this new record that we're working on is that band, and it's coming out really well. So I'm excited about it because you know we, we'll actually one day see each other and be able to play, you know, play, I hope, you know, but right now, I mean, you, you know, we're starting to get good at doing this. <laughs> I think we're getting, we're getting better at this. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Sackis is a, Sackis is one of the top players in Greece, just like uh, Achilles is a uh, different, totally different style as you probably hear on the record. I mean, he's a little, I would say like Achilles comes from more for like an Alan Holdsworth and he, he's not afraid to, he actually, what I like about Achilles is that he's, he comes from um, Holsworth and, and the he Scott Hendersons and all that stuff, the real flashy stuff. And he also comes from heavy metal, and he's not afraid to 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 you know not not afraid to say so. <laughs> so it, 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 he's got a different element to him. Where Sackis is a little more melodic player, I, I, I think he's more like a Larry Carlton or. Um, uh, Lee Rittenauer kind of player, which is, you know, both both great players, totally different styles. You know, everyone's like, oh, it's so weird that they, they're both from Greece and they sound so different. I'm like, just because they're from the same country doesn't mean they're going to sound the same, you know? So, yeah, totally. so I'm so I'm excited. We're, we're, we're putting that record together. We're about three quarters of the way done, and it's it's really turning out nice. Some original, some original stuff, and, and some. We're doing a few covers too. Uh, that's basically the next step. Is right is on. that well, is hopefully, hopefully that you know, if we'll sit on the record if we can't go play it live. But the, the whole thing is when we do go to Europe, I, I want the record to be there so we're, com we're promoting it as a band. Whereas the, the fuse box. I, you know, we can play some of those tunes live for sure, but I mean, uh, Mike Stern's not going to come flying over for you know two tunes, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but you know, having said that, uh, I just I've been a big fan of Mike Stern's for years, and, and you know, got to know him quite a bit. I used to go to the Fifty Five Bar in the Village all the time, and I've probably seen Mike Stern about you know, 200 or 300 times. I've seen him in Canada. I was walking down the street one time in Montreal, and tonight, Mike Stern, I'm like, really? really? <laughs> We're going to see Mike Stern in, in Montreal, okay? And then and then I played over in Italy one time, and, and he was on the same jazz festival, so we had dinner, and, you know, and we always talked about playing together because I was playing with the great um, guitarist that just passed away two years ago now, uh, Vic Juris. I don't, you know, I don't know if you know Vic. You know yeah. of him. Yeah. You know, sadly, he, he passed away. But, uh, but I was playing with him, and I remember one time I was at the 55, and I said to 
to you know Mike. Uh, you know that he goes, oh, yeah, man, you play with you you play with Vic Vic Juris. He goes, I dig Vic, man. We we got to play together sometime. And and I said, yeah, that would be great. And but it just never happened. You know how these things are. They, you know, it just it just never happened. You know, we talked and it never happened. But but now it did happen. So <laughs> you know, everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are. Your family, your friends, your fans. But ultimately, you live your life. You have a perception of yourself. Who do you think you are? Oh, boy. Good question, huh? <laughs> Who yeah. do you think you are? That's right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess at this point, I, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I might have thought of doing it a little differently, but at this point, it, it's it's too late to quit. I, I think I'm just trying to be the best drummer I can be and the best teacher, you know, because I do teach on the side, too, and 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 hopefully just someone who plays you know, that's growing as a musician. Uh, that's that's what I always want to do is I, I don't want to stay, in, you know, I've been stuck in financial situations before where, where you're stuck playing in a band that for a couple of years and you can't quit because that's what you do for a living and it becomes your job. And it gets real stale, and you you know you show up, and you're like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but yeah. but I what I I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, I don't mind being a leader. You know, I, I this is I guess my 11th or 12th record as a leader. My whole idea is that if no one's doing anything, I'm gonna do something. You know, it, you know, basically, if if no one's you know if, if no one's putting out music or writing music, then, all right, I'll do it. I'll be the leader. I don't care, you know. I don't like being the leader. No one, I don't think anyone really loves being the leader, but but that, that, it ended up being that way, and, uh, you know, it's it's great because I get to play with all these great players, but, you know. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you totally nailed it. Ken, this has been great, man. Thank you for opening up. Thanks for taking some time out. Good luck with the new album and the return to the stage. I really appreciate it. Cool. What do you think of the record? I love it. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is there any, any certain like weird things that you you know like? Is there certain? Because I know there's there's some progressive stuff in there too. Yeah, you know, I think the thing that's interesting about what's happened these days is COVID's really kind of brought new elements into music that's being released right now. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that a lot of ways that musicians are pushing the envelope and ways that they may not have done before March of 2020. So I just think that the paradigm of what's coming out from, you know, like harder edges and more fusion infused sounds, I think it's all really refreshing and good and necessary. And I think we're going to look back on this time and be rather captivated by how things changed. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and that's kind of even with the, the title of the record was this is going to be a fusion record for years. You know, fusion was taboo. You know, if you want to get any airplay, don't use that word, right? Anything with electricity, don't. But I was like, you know what? We're going to make a fusion record. And, you know, yeah. the fuse box. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, you're going to like it or you're not, but it's going to be a fusion record because that's what it is, you know? <laughs> yeah, for you sure. Know? Yeah. And that's what it is, for sure. I really appreciate you, you know, having me on. I, you know, uh, I'm looking for any way to promote this because, you know, and I appreciate you playing the record, too. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure, man. Good luck with it. All right. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Connecticut, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Ken for his time, cool, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.